Kishor Chaudhary are the co-chairmen and Dr. Sarang is a uh, convener. So, uh, we have added Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh. I think he got logged out. Am I audible? Yes, yes sure. audible. Yes, sure. There was some problem in the net. Yeah, sorry. And uh, Dr. Sarang is the convener. Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh is the modern, uh, new addition in the team of the moderators, and today he's moderating this session. Uh, and first and foremost, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the MCNS Latu for their successful arrangement uh, of the conference. And along with the delegates, speakers, and all the participants for making this Latu conference a very great success. I thank them from my base, uh, bottom of heart and from the MCNS Society. Now turning towards uh, today's uh, session, uh, so today we are having the webinar on uh, Moya Moya disease. Uh, Dr. Shubham, you have disabled me. Please allow me to share the screen. So uh, Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh is the uh, moderator and uh, we have uh, speakers, Dr. Dattatre Mujumdar, uh, he will be uh, talking on introduction to Moya Moya. Then Dr. Almal and Dr. Chavan will be uh, talking on the imaging and angiography in Moya Moya disease. And uh, Dr. Shivu Shankar Marjakke will be talking on indirect revascularization. Uh, then there is change in the uh, one speaker, Dr. Dhakoji, is not uh, today. He, in spite, uh, instead of him, Dr. Ayat Cheryan will be talking on direct revascularization. And there will be interesting case and discussion uh, with the, by the panelists. We have uh, eminent panelists, Dr. Vishal sir, be joining, joining late, Dr. Paritosh Pandey, and Dr. Ayat Cheryan. So this is the today's program in short. and. I would like to hand over to Dr. Ranjit Deshmukh, who please uh, start with you. Dr. Deshmukh, sir, please. Yeah, welcome to this exciting uh, webinar. A little offbeat topic uh, we have chosen. Uh, as uh, Duna Kesar has uh, explained, there are various eminent speakers and panelists. So uh, the format, uh, what I think we should do, go ahead with all presentations. And at the end, uh, we will ask our doubts to the uh, presenters and the panelists, and uh, we should have fruitful discussion. So I request uh, Dr. Muzumdar to start about the basics and pathology and epidemiology, etc., and his uh, experience with Moya Moya. Uh, as you know, Dr. Muzumdar uh, trained in KM and now the doyen of KM. Uh, looking forward to hear you, sir. So can I share? Thank you, thank you, Ranjit. Can you can we start? I can I share my screen? Yes, sir. Please. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. You are seeing. Okay. So uh, yeah, thank you. So today we are uh, uh, doing an update on Moya disease, and my job is to just give a brief introduction on Moya Moya. Because we have good speakers who are dealing with uh, imaging and you know talking on uh, uh, direct and indirect vascularization. So I will just briefly go through this uh, and try to understand uh, about Moya disease. So basically, Moya disease is a is a is a steno occlusive progressive arteriopathy that usually frequently affects the 
intracranial ICA, so much so that the proximal ICA, uh, proximal MCA and ACS, rarely it may involve the posterior circulation also. And uh, most of the time, it's, it's the Moyamaya word, as you know, that it is a Japanese word meaning puff of smoke or ambiguous because, because of the collaterals that develop because of this long-standing stenosis. And uh, the brain is struggling to get more blood supply. So uh, obviously, I will go into the details of what causes this Moyamaya disease. But progress, it's a progressive arteriopathy of the proximal intracranial vessels, mainly the ICA, the ACA, and the MCA. So this is how uh, you could you could describe the the, the Japanese term Moyamaya means puff of smoke. This puff of smoke, this these blood vessels are fragile, and this tend to sort of sustain the circulation. But during that time, during the growth period and all, they trend, they are, since they are more fragile, they tend to break. And they tend to the brain. And usually it can have bilateral and high blood pain accompanied with aneurysms, which have to be dealt uh, as per the uh, as per the presentation and this is the how the disease progresses so basically there is narrowing of the internal carotid arteries there is been consequence to that there is this origin of moya moya vessels at the base of the brain and there is a profuse collateral supply also it comes from the scalp and for, as the narrowing of the internal carotid artery progresses it may cause a complete blockage of the internal carotid arteries and you can see here that Sometimes, because of the certain genetic factors also, there is overgrowth of muscles within the artery. You can see that the, 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 the muscles within the artery also grow in and also cause the narrowing, preventing normal blood flow. So, in this is how the, this is the pathophysiology of Moya Moya disease. And you can see, in consequence to that, there are new collaterals forming. So, as the disease progresses, the collaterals also form. And... Usually there is a balance, then there is a steel, and there is an insufficiency. And when there is a that the at the breakage point, these vessels may tend to either cause an uh, ischemia or uh, or a bleed. So symptoms. So consequently, we as we know that these moya muscles muscles can uh, moya moya vessels can disease can cause either a an ischemic uh, uh, presentation or a hemorrhagic presentation. And consequently, the patients do manifest with headache, seizures, or they may. Uh, manifest with a, a lateralizing deficit, visual disturbances, difficulty with speaking, understanding, sometimes cognitive decline, developmental delays, involuntary movement. So there are a host kind of presentations that these patients can present. And usually there are two forms. One, there is a juvenile form. Moyama disease is also seen in the adult form. And if they can present with TIA, ischemic stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, epilepsy. In, in children, usually the, the symptoms are manifested by, you know, uh, hyperventilation, crying, coughing, straining. And in adult, most after the age of 10 years, the more it may, it presents more with hemorrhagic uh, 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 complications. So the hemorrhage can be intraventricular. You can see that in adults, the hemorrhage at, to the tune of 69%, it could be in the, in, in the intraventricular uh, region. And uh, most of them present because of these abnormal vascular networks, they present with aneurysms, as I said. And the mortality in the acute phase is 2.4%. Although it is not uh, this thing, but 2.4% with infarction is quite a big number. And he, in hemorrhage, it is even more, 16.4%. So I think this entity, once it is diagnosed, needs attention and treatment as early as possible. So ischemic events are, as I told, just more frequent in children. And uh, they present, uh, more, most of them present with TIAs. And that's why they, when a patient presents to us, it, uh, they usually are on anticonvulsants and on anticoagulation. And in adults, as I told you, it presents more with intraventricular hemorrhage. And uh, because of the ischemic presentation in children, there is an accompanying uh, epilepsy as well. Some patients do present, uh, uh, they don't have any, any symptoms, then they are diagnosed incidentally because of some other reason, some head injury or some infection. Uh, they, they could uh, be diagnosed as Moya Moya disease. The exact cause is not known. Uh, there is a, the, it's an idiopathic cause, genetic, and it is it has got certain inheritance is more in Japanese in India the incidence is directly not known but um, uh, let me tell you that if we find we are seeing a lot of Mohammed disease only thing that we don't have a registry so I'm sure that in India also the Mohammed disease is quite prevalent 
and we need to have a formal registry for the same. It can occur in neurofibromatosis, sickle cell disease, Down syndrome, and also Moama is seen as a secondary, you know, Moama syndrome is seen as a secondary consequence to radiation or a chemotherapy which, uh, for normally for pituitary tumors and craniopharyngiomas they are reported. So here, as you see, the familial Moama disease is associated more with SLE, basilative aneurysms, and screening is absolutely essential in these patients. Uh, they are more in females than, uh, than males. And 10% of them, the familial Moyamoya disease is seen in 10%. So at least when at least one first degree relative is affected, you, you label it as a, as a familial Moyamoya disease. They are linked to chromosomes 3, 6, 8, 12, and 17. So obviously, uh, we need to be aware of this and also do a genetic analysis in case we find some relatives to be uh, uh, having affected with this uh, presentation. It's seen more in, in the Southeast Asia, as, as I just mentioned. And the incidence is 100,000 per among the Asian Americans. And the prevalence in Asian Americans is about 0.28. So you can see that the uh, it is quite prevalent but because they are aware and they have the registry, uh, the, they are manifesting, they are coming out with such figures. But I'm, in India, all, I'm sure we must be having, uh, although not equivalent, but even similar figures. The primary Pathophysiology in, in uh, Mohamed is progressive fibrocellular thickening of the intima and you've got the internal elastic uh, lamina is becomes infolded. If it is it becomes infolded, it becomes tortuous, fragmented, the media is thinned out. There are apparently no inflammatory changes seen, but you as we know, the superior temporal arteries are also affected. And the secondary lesions in the Mohamed diseases are seen only in the basal ganglia regions, the thalamus triad and the lenticular triad arteries at the base of the brain. There are a host of uh, uh, factors, the fibroblastic growth factors, angiogenic factors, prostaglandin, some Epstein-Barr uh, Epstein infection is also known to cause uh, moya -moya, pre as a predisposing factor for moya, -moya. And obviously, there are uh, the, it is all related to the primary defect in the smooth muscle repair response. So, uh, the, the, there is certainly an idiopathic genetic inherited cause for these moya, moya diseases and that in, causes this progression uh, in the blood vessels. So as I suggest, as I just mentioned, you can see uh, the ischemic component is almost to the tune of 50% in children. And as you go more than 10 years, the hemorrhagic complications are, are more prevalent to the tune of 25%. So just remember that in, in the children, it is more of ischemia. In the adults, it is more of uh, hemorrhagic component. And one thing I just need to just inform that there are some PET studies, uh, the cerebral blood force studies uh, uh, as documented by PET, and metabolism moya moya. So as you know that after hyperventilation, the blood flow the blood flow is there, but when it is challenged, hyper hyperventilation or any stress response, the blood flow is decreased. And this is what, in, although the total blood volume in moya moya, moya disease is increased, it it is it does it's not is insufficient in times of stress response. And this is exactly what is done reversed by uh, your revascularization procedures. So. It has been documented that the blood flow is normalized after the revascularization or pro revascularization procedure, procedures, either direct or indirect. So I won't go too much into the details. So as we know that the diagnosis is either done by an uh, MRI or a CT angiogram, and CT angiogram is done is uh, gives sufficient information nowadays. So Moya Moya, we don't do MRI as a as a mandatory thing. If an MRI is available, uh, we uh, if uh, the angiogram uh, the DSA is it's not mandatory. Nowadays, people are all, uh, are uh, diagnosing on CT, NGO, and MRI. So, uh, but MRI gives you a very vivid picture of what is happening in the in the brain. So, this is some. I won't go again. We'll not go into too much of detail. So, you see intraventricular hemorrhages. You see uh, areas of uh, within the basal ganglia, thalamus, ventricular region, infarcts, and hemorrhages. And there is something like IV sign, which is known as the diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement, which is seen in the cortical and the subcortical regions. These are the things which will be uh, which will be dealt with in the later in the in the webinar. And you can see this is a classical moya moya, which which uh, in the basal ganglia you can see is multiple small tortuous vessels, uh, uh, which they extend from suprasolar system right up to the basal ganglia. And this is the supraclinar classical portion, which is gets stenosed uh, in uh, uh, in in moya moya, which can be unilateral or bilateral. Surgical treatments will be dealt again. There, these are bypass procedures, either direct revascularization or indirect revascularization. Many such procedures are there. 
But in addition, I would just mention sometimes omental transposition is also tried. Multiple burrows were also tried initially, which allows uh, the scalp vessels and the and the subdural vessels to have also increase the collateral blood supply. So with this, thank you very much. And I would uh, give my this, ask Ranjit uh, to continue the webinar. So I think I've just set the stage for the Moyama disease for other eminent speakers to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudumara. It was a very uh, short but uh, very informative uh, tour through basics of Moyama and the statistics and pathology was excellent. So uh, now I request Dr. Almale to uh, give a little more details about the radiology and especially I hope he will talk about perfusion studies to understand the hemodynamic changes in Moyama. Uh, I request Dr. Almale to start his presentation. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes, we can see, we can see, we can see. Yes, we can. So uh, in Moya Moya, uh, we have a protocol. I feel this is the protocol which is expected. That is BSA, MRI brain routine with 3D player, and TOF angiography, ASL perfusion, and DSC perfusion with post contrast T1 3D MRI to visualize vessel wall. And these are not widely available, but can be used in problem solving, especially for CBR. And CT perfusion with ASN is also used, but we are more comfortable with the MRI and CT also performs well if you have a wide range of uh, perfusion area, which, which can cover up to 8, 8 to 10 centimeters. Uh, just before that, I want to start with few cases we had in our hospital. Uh, this is a nine-year female child uh, with uh, IV sign extensive uh, coll pile collaterals are seen producing hyperintense hyper signal on flare MRI on right side and there is moderate flare hyperintensity on left side. And if you see here, there are flow whites in the periventricular region and also in the basal ganglia. And this is the MR angiogram, which was done uh, 10 years back, showing almost a complete obliteration of right IC and extensive central uh, uh, perforator collaterals. And if you see the source images, you can see that tiny extensive multiple basal ganglia collaterals also around the ventricles. These are the, these may be harboring some micro aneurysms and there are, these are also potential for rupture and causing bleed and these may cause intraventricular bleed. And this patient was treated with uh, indirect revascularization and after treatment, she, came, uh, she had some symptoms and she came after 10 years. And uh, you can see that all the IV sign has gone, uh, good response, all this central uh, if you see the perfusion MRI, still you can see perfusion abnormal. This is ASL perfusion MRI. Uh, you can see it is better to compare with this anatomical image. Without anatomical image, uh, it's quite confusing. So if you see this area, you can see there is some atrophy here and also some decreased perfusion in the frontal lobes. Again here, occipital lobe uh, perfusion abnormality is there. And... Uh, in the high vertic vertex region, increased perfusion is seen, but if you see the anatomical image, there is gliosis. This is an artifact which is produced on ASL perfusion due to delayed transit, transit time. And by using anatomical images, you can guess that this is artifact, this is not the increased perfusion. And uh, this is after uh, bur hole re perfusion. You can see multiple bar holes and here we found uh, also adenoid enlargement. And uh, we also did CT perfusion. And uh, CT perfusion, most important maps are TTD. Other maps are cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volumes. They don't show much change in Moya Maya disease. 
they're mainly useful in uh, stroke patients but in case of moya moya these ttd maps are very helpful which is a time to decay it's a time taken by the contrast to reach the brain so if you see the red is more and the green is intermediate and the bluish is uh, low so you can see a lot of red areas indicating that increased time taken by the contrast to reach here so a lot of abnormality on right side which is symptomatic side and just for comparison the this was a mri done uh, 10 year back and recent ct angio was done and ct angio showing complete uh, clearance of the central perforate perforator vessels which has dramatically reduced the risk of hemorrhage and you can see the lot of collaterals from the temporal arteries another case uh, came with stroke this is a subacute infarct also small chronic infarcts in the caudate and you can, you can see the two linear lines indicating there is vessel wall thickening uh, in the mca and there is also nodular thickening in the terminal part of ic and those areas corresponding areas also shows GRE blooming indicating some platelet aggregation in the stenosed inflamed segment. And we did contrast study and this is vessel wall enhancement. You can see thickening here, obliteration of terminal part of terminal IC. And also there is thickening, MC is also thickened. This BM A1 segment is also obliterated and you can see the MR angular. There is a lot of negative remodeling. There is gradual narrowing of the segments. And this patient was treated with uh, aggressive medical management and followed. And after three months, there was a decrease in enhancement, suggesting decreased inflammation. You can see the angiogram, which was done three months back. And after three months, there are some collaterals here seen, but not that big. And we compared the perfusion again in MRI. Of contrast perfusion, only important map is. TTP that is TTD in CT and TTP in MRI. It shows decreased, uh, so it increased time to peak, increased time taken by the contrast to reach the brain parenchyma, which has significantly reduced here, suggesting there is a good collateralization. And uh, he is on medical management. And if there is any doubt here, iodine IMP spec would be helpful to rule out any CVR uh, that is uh, cerebrovascular reactivity. Third patient, this is a 63 year male who came with hemorrhagic stroke. And if you see this uh, GRE blooming here and here also some dark areas indicating mm -hmm. previous episode of hemorrhage. And the, in cases of hemorrhagic stroke, strokes we usually don't look at the vessels but we saw these vessels you can see the left ic is severely narrowed right ic show wall thickening and if you see the t2 scan the supracellular systems showed multiple tiny vessels collateral vessels moya moya vessels so zoom the image you can see that a lot of moya moya vessels on right side mcs are looking smaller one this patient uh, went dama, so we were not able to do it as a Moya Moya protocol imaging. And this is from this is case from literature where we can do all the studies in on MRI that is angiogram, vessel wall imaging. You can see the old infarcts. This is a contrast, 3D contrast showing multiple tiny collaterals. You can see cerebral blood flow. Very there is a lot of any it looking symmetrical, no abnormality seen. So we usually use ASL cerebral blood for maps to evaluate the cerebral blood flow and TTP maps of contrast perfusion to evaluate the uh, transit time taken by the contrast to reach the brain parenchyma. And after 20 seconds of breath hold, this bold perfusion MRI was performed and a good uh, Reactivity is seen in the ACA territory, but there is a poor response in the MCA territory on both sides, indicating that poor cerebrovascular reaction. Uh, this was a, this is a very busy slide which shows uh, what was the protocol used here. And uh, 
in conclusion i feel that uh, mr with dsc perfusion and contrast study solves most of the problems but in case of doubt you can use it i expect for cbr and follow up imaging brain routine with asl perfusion and top angio will do and if you want to see the mcsta anastomosis then ct will be better to evaluate the, because bones are also well seen on the image thank you sir thank you dr almale for great insights uh, we understand that we need to study perfusion uh, imaging more uh, in ct and mr to understand uh, better uh, this pathology uh, now i request dr rajendra sawhan he is a intervention radiologist with a lot of experience in pune and he has done dsa for a uh, lot of our my, my patients so uh, i request dr uh, rajendra sawhan to shed light on angiographic findings thank you can you see my screen mm -hmm. oh, you can you can share the screen can you see no 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 now yeah yeah we can see this here yeah so we'll start with the uh, dsa findings uh, this is the case which shows uh, significant stenosis in the terminal portion of the left ica and it has involved the proximal m1 segment of left mc also the left aca is already occluded and the vessel which is seen going posteriorly is actually the prominent pecom and fetal pca kind of vessel so here the terminal ICA, M1 segment, and ACA. All those vessels are involved by the disease process. Now, the same patient has a follow-up DSA after some time, which shows significant progress of the disease. Now, the MCA is totally occluded here. The M1, which was seen initially, is completely not visualized now. And the whole of the ICA circulation is supplied to the Moya Moya vessels and the pile collaterals coming from the left PCA. So these are the retrograde pile opacifications of the uh, distal ACA branches and we have a MCA opacification here. So uh, we have a Suzuki grading for the involvement of the Moya Moya disease. There are total six stages and as the stage progresses, there is a further narrowing or occlusion of the ICA T region. From stage two, we have an initiation of the Moya Moya collateral vessels, and that increases to stage three and stage four. From stage three to stage four, we have a reduction in the Moya Moya collaterals. From stage one to stage four, five, we have a further increase in narrowing of the distal ICA and proximal M1, proximal A1 segments. The Moya Moya vessels are completely absent in stage 5, complete reduction of the Moya Moya collaterals. And in stage 5, stage 6, the entire ICA circulation is taken over by the transdural collaterals coming from the ECA. So this is how the broad category or staging of the uh, Moya Moya disease by Suzuki. So this is how it looked. Initially, just narrowing of the terminal ICA, proximal ACA, MCA. And in stage two, we have initial initiation of the Moya Moya collaterals, which increases in stage three. At the same time, there's a further reduction in the anti-gate flow in the ACA MCA circulation. And most of the circulation is taken care by the Moya Moya vessels. In stage four, there is a significant reduction in the Moya Moya collaterals, and we have a transdural collaterals coming from the ACA. So in stage five and stage six, there's a complete takeover of ICA circulation by a ECA. And this, these are the collaterals and different arteries which are, are contributing to the affected region. We can have a collaterals coming from the posterior communicating artery. We can have a vessels uh, coming from the PCA. 
either can be cranial branches or the pile cortical branches coming from the PCA and supplying the ACA circulation. Uh, we can have a, a similar uh, collateral vessels coming from ACA if the MC is uh, affected. Uh, these are the biomere vessels which are seen in the terminal ICA region and the proximal ACMC region, basically the uh, dilated perforators coming from the terminal ICA M1 segment and M1 segments. So they form the moya moya vessels. Significant collaterals are seen coming from the ophthalmic artery when the terminal ICA is occluded and they can deform and uh, opacify few of the ACA branches. And as I mentioned in the last uh, stage, we have extensive dural branches, transdural uh, collaterals coming from the middle meningeal artery and uh, supplying the ACA MCA regions. So the uh, figure A shows mild narrowing of the terminal ICA and uh, proximal A1 segment. Figure B, next stage, significant reduction of the terminal ICA and the M1 segment with few prominent vessel collaterals seen, where my vessels are seen. Further reduction in the diameter of the M1 segment. Again, severe stenosis of the M1 with moyama vessels. In E, most of the circulation is seen to the moyama vessels with complete non-opacification of the M1 segment of the MCA. And F, total occlusion of the ICA, MCA, ACA, and even the disappearance of the moya moya collateral vessels. So this, in this stage, we'll have a extensive collaterals coming from the external carotid artery. Uh, important findings along with the moya moya vessels, we can have a nodular blush on one of the perforators and that can represent the aneurysm, usually lead to either intraventricular or intraparenchymal hemorrhages. So on follow-ups, these can reduce in size or may increase in size. Uh, as Dr. Muzumdal sir mentioned, we can have a involvement of posterior circulation. So here, extensive collaterals are seen on vertebral angiograms. But if you see carefully, there is a significant stenosis of the P1, P2 segments of bilateral PCLs. So though there are extensive collaterals coming from the vertebral artery, the PCAs are actually involved by the disease process in this case. This is this is uh, ICA towns and lateral uh, projections. On lateral, we have a paucity of capillary blush in the uh, high frontoparietal region, periroliantic region, and the exact location is supplied by the transdural collaterals which are seen coming from the middle meningeal artery on ECA angiograms. Another case, extensive transdural collaterals coming from the uh, ECA uh, vessels and opacifying the uh, MCA circulation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Rajendra, for uh, nice uh, basics and advanced angiographic studies. Uh, I request now Dr. Aicharian to talk on direct vascularization. Uh, Dr. Charyan is head of the department in uh, Karad Medical College and a very well-known orator and demonstrator in a lot of conferences, internationally known with a lot of publications. So, Dr. Charyan. Ranjit, are we losing the connection in between or it is only on my side? Uh, no, is I it... was uh, able to hear clearly, Rajendra. Your presentation, uh, uh, little bit I was... Uh, okay. There was some poor, poor connection kind of thing. In short. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes yeah. we can see. Yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you. I'm very much honored by this opportunity. Today, I am in Mumbai, actually. We had a very good workshop at the Nesicon. And uh, I am at the hotel, so I'm sorry I had to 
I request Ranjit to change my timings a bit. And uh, I was listening intent, uh, intently to the rest of the speakers and it was uh, a very good uh, deliberation on Moya Moya, something which we really uh, look at in Karad as well. We, uh, we have been collaborating with the medicine department, trying to identify more and more of these cases. Now, my talk would be on STMCs, especially with the exoscope. We've given this talk many times. I've, I'm sure many of you would have seen this. And uh, we, um, we do direct uh, uh, STMCs and, uh, uh, of course, low flow bypass and high flow bypass. Which of which I prefer low flow because uh, high flow is, uh, although it's technically not very difficult compared to a low flow, uh, what, we, what we've seen is uh, high flow uh, sometimes leads to luxury perfusion and uh, uh, luxury perfusion hemorrhages. So a low flow we prefer in many cases. In this case, what I'm going to show you is when uh, we had a cavernous uh, aneurysm, a giant cavernous aneurysm you can see now. Yeah, so this cavernous aneurysm, uh, this lady passed the BTO, but the problem was that even though she passed the BTO, there was a delay in filling. Um, earlier, when somebody used to pass the BTO, we used to go ahead and just ligate the carotid. We used to think that the contralateral uh, carotid would take care of the circulation. But then what happened is we had, uh, over the last nine years, we had two cases where the patient in a completely different uh, time, not immediate post-op, these patients developed strokes and we decided that maybe we're putting a stress on the circulation and whenever there's a hypotension or vasovagal syncope or anything of that sort, this patient probably could, could be going for a stroke. So we thought if somebody doesn't pass a BTO, we'd go ahead and uh, do a high flow bypass for them. And if somebody does pass the BTO, and especially if we see a little bit of a delay in the filling, we'll go ahead and do a low flow bypass. Now, I know some of my friends, I mean, Yuha was uh, not very forthcoming. He was not agreeing for this. He was telling that ligation would be good. Uh, Few of the other friends, Michael, Mustafa, they, they say probably this is not necessary. Some people feel that if you're doing a bypass, you should do a high flow bypass. Well, that's their perspective, but uh, you know, we all have our different perspective. This has worked very well for us. So this is exactly what we are going to show you today. Uh, now, I do a in-flap uh, ST harvesting, which means I don't uh, harvest the ST first and then go for the bypass. When I do the flap, I cut the ST around this point, of course. And then after that, I harvest the ST. This is much faster. And uh, usually it's done by our junior consultants or residents. So it is much easier also for them. So in flap is much more faster and easier. So this is the position after uh, the ST is harvested. So the ST is being harvested now. And you can see uh, with the exoscope, the kind of zoom that you get, it's ex exceptional uh, high magnitude. And you can see even the, the vasa vasorum of the vessel. Uh, this is what I sometimes call ultra micro neurosurgery compared to micro neurosurgery. So 
you're getting about 50 to 60 times with excellent stereo depth zoom with excellent stereo depth compared to 25 to 30 times for the microscope. Now we open, we find M4, mostly M4 vessels, not even, not M2 or M3. The good thing about M4 is that, you know, you uh, your occlusion time doesn't really create much problems. But the only thing about M4 is they are very, very small vessels. And you need a, a lot of patience, good technique, and very good magnification for this bypass. So, again, uh, we tried out with high zoom, we tried out many instruments. Uh, we were using Esculap instruments, but then we found they're not as good as uh, we, we want them to be. So, we developed our own instruments with the Mumbai base company. It took us two years, but we have uh, uh, developed excellent bypass instruments. And we're using those instruments now. So we develop, we, uh, we take a, a small segment of the M4 and uh, we cut the ST at an angle. Generally, we don't need to uh, fish mouth for M4. There's no not real no real need for fish mouthing. If you cut at an angle, it's quite okay generally. And you can see now the zoom at which we are doing this. It's very important to keep. Uh, uh, a rubber glove cut like this above the patty because you don't want all those patty fibers in the field. Now we use this scissor to do the arteriotomy. Use uh, methylene blue to stain the arteriotomy. The arteriotomy is uh, measured in such a way that it should be approximately equal to the uh, the donor vessels opening and we go that's uh, uh, three o'clock stitch now the three o'clock and the nine o'clock uh, foot so people call it heel and toe so we put that first and then the two hours 30 minute stitch is the most difficult part i mean that is place where usually you have a leak from. So two o'clock stitch. I mean, I wouldn't call it two o'clock stitches. It's a much more closer than two o'clock. So this is a nine o'clock stitch going in. Once you, uh, once you finish the nine o'clock and the three o'clock, then it's just a matter of uh, completing the rest of the stitches. I don't go, um, I don't go uh, continuous. I, I don't like continuous. I mean, I have my reason. I believe that the ST, we have many times seen that the ST increases in its uh, diameter over time. You can see that in the CT angios and the perfusion also gets much better with ST. It can even combat your high flow bypass in a, over a period of time, although not immediately. So, but if you do a continuous suture, I believe that this doesn't happen. I'm sure um, Michael or people who do uh, continuous don't agree with this, but uh, I, I'm I'm sure I believe that it it doesn't uh, increase. I mean, it, it doesn't increase over time, but the continuous sutures, they, the uh, uh, the STMC bypass site, the perfusion increases over time. And so once you're done, you should not have a leak. Many people say it's okay to have a leak. Well, it's okay to have a very small leak, if at all, but not a big leak. And you put your surgery cell and try to stop. It's not good. 
So once you have about 10 to 12 sutures, there's no leak. And that's the ICG after the carotid occlusion. And um, after the after that, you can see the carotid the C6 segment completely occluded. You can see. And uh, with permissions, this is what uh, after the surgery. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Dr. Uh, Cherian. First of all, thanks for taking up this topic at a very short notice. And sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, and thanks for excellent technique. Now everybody is looking to get their hands on exoscope and learning from your technique. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Ranjit. Very honored. And all the best to Shiv Shankar. Okay, yeah. then. Next speaker is... Yeah, thank you. Right. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Shushankar Majakke from Kaneri Mat, uh, uh, near Kolapur. Uh, he is uh, he has uh, a very large volume and amazing work of uh, vascular neurosurgery apart from all other micro neurosurgery, and uh, he has done a lot of uh, direct vascularization also. But he has agreed to present uh, indirect vascularization. So, Dr. Shushankar, please. Yeah, uh, good evening. Am I audible? The screen is seen? Yeah, the screen is already visible and you are now audible. Yes. Please start. Uh, yeah, after such an uh, educative uh, presentation by previous speakers, I think my talk is made quite easy. Uh, I have personal experience of uh, doing around uh, 40 uh, procedures for Moema disease. Uh, initially, I started with uh, EDAMS, that is uh, in-diet bypass and were appealed, receptive to diet bypass and now we are doing uh, uh, combined bypasses where we do mix the diet bypass and the indirect bypasses. So, uh, uh, as you all know, that uh, there are more than ten indirect procedures that we do for uh, OMI disease, and uh, at least each procedure will take a minute. And I have to emphasize on the principle and concept of uh, indirect revascularization. So, I hope to finish in fifteen minutes. Yes. Yeah, uh, Moema disease combines uh, two pathophysiologies. The one is the progressive vascular occlusive disease leading to cerebral ischemia, and it is paralleled by a disease-specific pro-arteriogenic mechanism that causes uh, a direct uh, uh, diverse intracranial to intracranial as well as extracranial to intracranial collaterals. Uh, that is, body's indigenous bypass that happens mainly in the stage uh, six of uh, Suzuki. So there are no methods of arresting the underlying arteriopathy that we all know and the treatment of Moema disease is predicated on the restoring of blood flow to the affected hemisphere that is ischemic one. There are uh, major uh, three therapeutic options. What we have, one is medical, surgical, and more recently endovascular. So all three treatments uh, set the goal of reducing the risk of ischemic and hemorrhagic injury by improving the cerebral perfusion. Coming to the natural course of disease, currently the uh, no medical treatment can halt or reverse the arteriopathic process in Moema disease. So despite the lack of randomized clinical trials, an overwhelming number of studies have demonstrated a favorable outcome after surgery in selected pediatric patients with Moema phenomena. Although the natural history of patients with Moema phenomena is unclear, a significant number of patients continue to have a disease progression and overall, overall outcome for both children and adults is quite poor. So coming to medical therapy, it has uh, three major components. One is the prevention of thrombosis, maintenance of intercular volume, and mitigation of uh, non specific symptoms, mainly headache and seizures. Medical therapy is distrusted, unevenly incorporated, and currently no medical treatments can halt or reverse the disease process. And mainly the use of antiplatelets is quite controversial because this disease mainly affects the tunica muscularis and intima. So the, the antiplatelets are used mainly when the intima is damaged. Coming to surgical therapy, the most important goal of surgical revascularization is to prevent the cerebral infarction by improving the cerebral blood flow and restoring mainly the reserve capacity. Surgery for Moema disease is predicated on the finding that branches of ECA, that is extra artery, are not affected in the disorder most commonly. They can be affected. Thus, these branches can be used as a source of supply to the ischemic brain. Divers, uh, we know that there is indigenous bypass happens from intracranial that is Moema vessels, and later on, the extracranial that is ECA takes over, 
when the complete ICA circulation stops. The main objective of surgery is to augment the intracranial blood flow using an external cavity system by either a direct or a pyrosynogenesis that is indirect. So there are mainly direct and indirect. Uh, so some surgeons opt to, like we do uh, combined procedures nowadays. So there is a considerable debate exists over the selection of individual operative approaches. Bypass surgery for treating myeloma vasculopathy is often regarded as a treatment of choice. The surgical procedure selection is predicted on the symptom presentation, patient's age, anatomy, and surgeon's experience. In most cases, there is a predilection to choose pile synongiosis or direct bypass because of the data supporting long-term durability of these grafts and ability to offer this operation to any age group. In certain cases, however, the grafting of diet bypass is technically more challenging and sometimes not feasible because the small caliber vessels and fragile cortical vasculature, uh, mainly in vasculopathy, where vascular remodeling of the tunica muscularis render the uh, cortical vessels prone to rupture during suturing uh, while anastomosing them. One of the greatest concerns regarding this surgical uh, procedure is a risk of perioperative stroke that is reported to happen around 4 to 10 percent of operations. So, meticulous surgical technique, adequate perioperative hydration, skilled anesthetic monitoring, and effective pain management many in kids uh, all help to reduce the complication rates. So, direct procedures such as uh, superior temporal artery to MC bypass immediately restores the blood flow at the time of surgery itself. And in contrast, indirect procedures require weeks or months, mainly around three months, to establish the coital vessels. Although the pathogenesis of Moema disease uh, has not been fully eradicated, the effectiveness of surgical revascularization is preventing stroke has been addressed by many studies. The main mechanism of uh, surgical revascularization is augmenting the intracranial blood flow using an external carotid system by either uh, doing a direct bypass or an uh, indirect bypass using a pile synangiosis. This can improve uh, resting cerebral blood flow as well as a vascular reserve capacity that is very important. Symptomatic patients are usually offered surgical treatment, but asymptomatic children that sometimes they have a bilateral disease where one side is symptomatic, other side is asymptomatic. So they are also operated if the imaging findings indicate severe perfusion deficits or a progression of disease over a period of time. So different centers differ in their philosophy of treating bilateral disease with a single or a staged anatomy. So it's a single setting, one side uh, surgery and a single setting bilateral side surgeries. So coming to indirect bypass surgery, that is my topic of discussion today. This surgical procedures only requires the attachment of the vascularized donor tissue onto the surface of the brain and gradually but steadily new vascularization occurs between these tissues in Moema disease because of the angiogenic factors. So indirect sur uh, surgical techniques for Moema disease have evolved over a period of five decades. Their variety in reflection uh, is a reflection of surgical ingenuity and advance in the modern uh, medicine. Vasculars donor tissues such as supertemporal artery, gallia, dura, muscle and omentum have been used alone or in combination to augment the intracranial blood flow. All of these are served by uh, extracurricular artery and in some cases reinforcing the anticerebral artery and the posterior artery that is also required and we do it the hospital artery in PCS. So the concept, the general principle of indirect bypass surgery is very unique and specific for myeloma disease and nowadays indirect bypass procedure is indicated almost only for myeloma disease. The assumption underlying indirect procedure is that the tissues will grow together over a period of time and bringing with them collateral vasculature, which will gradually provide the brain with the additional blood flow. Indirect procedures avoid many potential technical pitfalls of direct anastomosis, including ischemia when we temporarily clip the arteries for bypass. And the bypass, direct bypass requires extended anesthesia time and risk of perioperative stroke. And sometimes relatively small caliber of uh, extracranial and intracranial arteries may not be possible to do right bypass. So this is uh, the pictorial schematic representation of pile synangiosis, wherein the vessel is taken in and over a period of time, gradually these vessels have collaterals that supplies the brain. So uh, this is a diagram which shows the larger the size of the craniotomy, that is the larger the area that is exposed and uh, mainly more are the uh, vascular supplying pedicles like muscle, artery, dura, pericranium, yes, vessels, the more will be the collaterals form. So uh, previous studies have suggested that elevated levels of angiogenic factors in the CSF may play an important role in the aggressive new vascularization between the brain surface and the uh, donor tissues. Previously reported donor tissues include dura matter, temporalis muscle, gallia pronotica, pericranium, and omentum. 
the wide arachnoid opening is perhaps biologically it is very important aspect to the surgery because when the arachnoid opens the vessels grows in opening the arachnoid offers the double benefit by removing the mechanical barrier to ingrowth while also facilitating improved contact between the nascent vasculature and the growth factors arachnoid opening is very much critical and spending time to widely open as much as area of uh, arachnoid is quite important in in diagnostication so earlier attempt was made by uh, uh, Cradle in 1942, but had seizures because of the muscles. And however, uh, Karasawa took it further using encephalomyosin angiosis. So this is how the indirect uh, procedures have proceeded in the last 50 years. So Suzuki staging has been clearly discussed by uh, Dr. Chewan. And uh, this is, we need to know because we have to decide about the surgery depending on the stage. And the last stage of disease where complete IC is occluded, all the vessels are blocked and collateral vessels disappear and external carotid would have done complete uh, collateral supply. So that stage probably may not require the surgery. So when we are doing this uh, indirect uh, bypass or uh, reflux procedure, we have to be very much uh, aware of the external carotid anatomy because as a neurosurgeon, we are much focused on the integrated anatomy. So mainly the STA supplies uh, two branches that is parietal and uh, frontal, they supply the scalp and we harvest it for bypass. And even the uh, internal maxillary artery, that is IMAX, has uh, two branches. One is mid maxillary artery that supplies the dura that we can use as a bypass uh, part, medical. And uh, the temporalis muscle is supplied with the anterior deep temporal artery and posterior deep temporal arteries. They also uh, enhance the collaterals in uh, indirect bypass. So we should know the anatomy of these uh, vessels which go into the external catheter supply. So what we do is uh, one day before surgery, we can use the aspirin. We give around 2 to 5 mg per kg body weight and admit the patient to hospital and uh, we give a IV fluid to maintain the normal volemia. And uh, at induction of anesthesia is quite important and uh, during surgery, we have to maintain a normal tension. The BP should not fall, hypotension should be avoided and uh, the temperature should be normal thermic. We should avoid hyperventilation and maintain normal carbia. Normal pH has to be maintained. So this has to be continued during surgical procedure also and postoperatively, it is very important to maintain the fluid balance and avoid hyperventilation, mainly in the kids because of the pain, they cry and the pain control is very important to avoid post-surgical ischemia because surgery itself is a stress and we can do the aspirin. So, uh, as I told, there are more than 10 uh, different procedures for doing indirect bypass surgery depending on the vascular pedicle that we use. And keplomyosin angiosis, wherein we use a temporal muscle and uh, deep tem uh, temporal artery supply this. And keplomyo artery syringosis, where you use a uh, muscle and artery and keflo duro arteriosyringosis where we use a dural pedicle that is between the artery and the superior artery and keflo duro arteriosyringosis that is most commonly done has a robust collateral supply wherein we use all these four pedicles and uh, the other methods are using of gallia pyloritica and dural immersion techniques and various combined procedures where we combine the direct procedure and indirect procedures and multiple bur holes and omental transfers so to begin with uh, the multiple bur hole technique the principle of technique is to facilitate the communication between the external and intercated artery system through bone and meningeal opening. It increases the number of burrow holes and uh, the brain surface that which will be reostrized again. So this surgical technique is simple and safe and bilateral reostrization is easily done during the safe procedure because we can expose both the uh, sides of the brain uh, skull and uh, through unique cosmetic incision that is bicoronal incision without increasing the morbidity rate to the surgeon. Subgallial dissection is performed gently with the particular attention to preserve the subcutaneous vascularization that we should not affect, but that is going to give the collaterals. And mainly, ST has to be preserved at its branches, and periosteum is not elevated to preserve these vessels. So, this is uh, what is done when the patient is positioned. We mark a bicoronal incision, and then subgallic dissection is done, and periosteal traps are elevated. Multiple bur holes are made extensive on bilateral side, frontal, temporal, and even go to parietal regions. And uh, dural and arachnoid, uh, once the dura is open, we open the arachnoid also. That is a very important part of the step. And then peristal traps are inserted in the subdural space and the wounds are closed. The barrels are made around 3 cm apart from each other. And uh, 3 cm triangular periosteal trap is elevated with the tip facing towards the midline. So that supplies the uh, uh, subarachnoid space. And under the uh, operative microscope, we open the dura and open the... Uh, so we preserve this middle medial artery when we open the dura. And once the arachnoid is opened, the peristal trap is then positioned over the brain in subdural space. So coming to encephalomyosin angiosis, uh, wherein we take the muscle flap inside and keep, uh, after opening the dura and inverting the flaps, we keep the 
muscle over the brain surface after opening the arachnoid. So, however, most experts agree that usage of temporis muscle as a vascular graft probably provides the best prerequisite for successful indirect division due to because it has a rich blood supply and large surface area. So, usually, this EMS alone as a primary association should only be considered for treatment of asymptomatic hemisphere in pediatric patients with myomai disease. So, the key principle here is the size of keratomy should be big enough to accommodate the whole of the muscle. Sylvan fissure has to be open so that we have to still be exposed because we have to keep the muscle over the frontal and upper lobe. Meticulous hemostasis as well because uh, uh, muscle has a good supply and we are keeping it tight to the brain. And compression of the muscle pedicle should be avoided when we keep up the bone plaque. So importantly, monopolar cautery should be avoided while we are raising the muscle because that might uh, you know, damage the muscles. They are supplying the muscle and uh, collaterals will decrease. And once the dura is open, we need to preserve the middle artery. And muscle graft is uh, placed over the, the brain and hemostasis properly achieved. And uh, difficulty is what we encounter is mainly harvesting the middle mill artery because middle mill artery might uh, uh, get damaged when we are elevating the bone graft. So we have to drill it meticulously under microscope and preserve the middle mill artery. It's quite important because most of the time they are uh, uh, hypertrophied. So this is a schematic diagram where you can see the muscle is taken inside under the skull and uh, Arachnoid is open and the muscle is fixed to the inverted edges of the dural leaf plates. So the robust supply from the muscle uh, over a period of time uh, supplies the uh, underlying brain tissue. So the next is encephalo durosynangiosis, wherein uh, we open the dura and invert the flap because we know that the outer uh, surface of the dura rather than inner surface has the blood supply and that has to be noted inside and arachnoid has to be opened so that that supplies. So, EDS is seldom performed as a standalone operation today. It has to be in combination. So, this is what is being done. You can see that uh, the once the dura is open, the middle man is out and the dura is open. And uh, that is inverted and uh, kept over the brain tissue. So, uh, coming to encephalo duro artery of synangiosis, that is EDAMS, uh, myosynangiosis. And it is has it is one of the good procedure, indirect procedure, where uh, it combines aspects of all major indirect revascularization procedures. Dura defects are inverted onto the underlying cortex and arterial dura mainly STA, muscle flap, and dura apodurosis also can be used. So a large creative is performed to allow sufficient room to apply the ST vessels and passage as well as the temporal muscle graft. The dura defects are opened in a cruciate fashion and the middle meningeal artery should be preserved. So the arachnoid is opened sharply over the large cortical arterial branches so that the collateral develops and the pile synangiosis may be performed using a tangero suture and the STA branch. The STA branch is placed over and uh, we suture with the pia uh, with the STA branch. So temporary muscle is placed over the remaining exposed brain and secured in place using uh, sutures in a similar fashion. And the ratio of extensive vessel collateration was higher in patients with EDAMs rather than any of these previous procedures, that is muscle, dura, artery, when used singly. So this is what is done. You can see in the diagram that the uh, ST is harvested and that is kept over the brain and sutured to the pia and middle middle arteries are preserved and uh, they send some collaterals and the dura is inverted inside over the uh, exposed arachnoid brain. So that supplies and finally the muscle is sutured to the edges of the dura. So the vessels ingrow from the muscle also. So the muscle, artery, dura and uh, vessel, all this supply that is EDAMS. So uh, the next procedures are like uh, duro, Encephalo synangiosis, where the dura is separately is mainly the inner layer. So, uh, coming to the end, uh, the last few minutes, uh, combined reaspiration, wherein you use uh, the direct bypass and indirect press together. And uh, different, uh, usually, we prefer uh, what we do recently is a direct bypass with the indirect press, mainly the EDAMs we do. And uh, it's found to have a very good uh, uh, revascularization compared to any other indirect procedures. So, these are a few of the combined reaspirations you can see uh, in the pictures here that uh, the STA is uh, anastomosed to the frontal STA here, first frontal cortical branches, and one STA that's parietal is kept over for the indirect bypass, and the uh, dura is inverted, the irams is completed along with this thing, and uh, one branch is, can be taken over the frontal region, and at the similar time, we can open the occipital region for the occipital artery also. So these are how the frontal region bypass is done, temporal region bypass is done in a similar procedure. So that various procedures can be combined together. And these combined procedures have very good results. Coming to the last uh, method of doing uh, indirect uh, bypass, that is commental transpositions and transplantations. 
Advantage of omental transplantation or transplant include relative plasticity of the great uh, graft material and capability of covering a large surface area. And we all know that uh, it is a abdominal policeman had a very robust blood supply and it uh, seals all the uh, perforations. That is what we see in gel surgery. And omentum may be transposed wherein a graft is taken up to there, extended, transplanted when the graft is completely taken out and re anastomosed the vessels of the STA. So the greater momentum is harvested through a midline organization and the gastro vessels are dissected and preserved and a large tenotomy is fashioned on the affected side. So the uh, momentum transplantation, we do direct end-to-end -end anastomosis with the gastro vessels with the STAs using the 10 9 switches. And in momentum transposition, transposition, where when performed instead of transplantation, the harvested momentum is left attached to its vascular supply in the abdomen and it is lengthened to a series of relaxing cuts and it is tunneled like what we tunnel uh, the uh, pipition subcutaneously to the cranium and placed in a direct contact to the cerebral cortex. I will show you in the diagram here. So uh, these have been associated with the promising results, particularly in patients with recurrent symptoms after undergoing the direct or indirect procedures, wherein we can have a complete coverage from the external source. So this is how the momentum is harvested. In the last diagram, you can see here that uh, the vessels of the gastroepiphytic vessels, vein and artery, they are bypassed uh, with the ST and STV. And uh, this is the transplantation of the momentum. And this is a transposition of the momentum where the momentum is not divided. It is extended and tunneled down up to the cranium and the whole cerebral hemisphere is covered. So uh, coming to the end, the last part, uh, these surgical procedures, mainly the indirect, are not difficult for a well-trained neurosurgeons. However, the neurosurgeon should be aware of several important issues about this procedure. Indirect revascularization functions as effective collaterals in majority of the patients, mainly pediatric, but it is uh, effective only in 50 to 70% of the patients and they require STMC bypass. So indirect re revascularization requires three to four months to complete the development of effective collaterals. And it carries the risk of ischemic stroke during that period when the collateral develops. And uh, this can be avoided in uh, case of that bypass. So the extent of anatomy and dural opening largely determines the extent of surgical collaterals I showed in the previous diagrams that uh, surgical design should be determined according to the extent of ischemia. We have to expose the areas of the frontal and uh, temporal lobe also uh, for uh, extensive bypass. So these are the few of the advantages. It is quite simple and easy. And uh, the disadvantage is that the surgical collaterals develop two to three months uh, post surgery. And it has been found that uh, the, there is a higher perioperative ischemic stroke when we do in diet bypass rather than diet bypass. So it is effective only in 50% of the adults, and they eventually require or they require directly the direct bypass. So diet bypass is where the cerebral blood flow improves just immediately during surgery and after surgery. And uh, it has been found that it is a lower incidence of perioperative ischemic stroke because directly will be connecting and uh, supplying the blood to the uh, brain, hungry brain actually. So, so TA is quickly disappears in diet bypass. And this requires a good surgical training and it can be easily done because suturing is a basic uh, technique we all learn from beginning and suturing the vessels under a high magnification, uh, we can learn over a period of time. So there is only a risk of uh, possible uh, hyperperfusion that we never encountered in more than 20 cases that we did. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me opportunity uh, here. And uh, I think uh, I have taken more than 15 minutes. Thank you, Organizer, for giving me this time. Thank you very much. Ran Ranjit, let me make a few comments. Thank okay, Ranjit? Sure, sure, sir. First I of all, Dr. Shiv uh, Shankar, Shankar yes. that you have summarized the entire story very beautifully. Like I have heard about you and I have uh, seen some of the cases that you have operated on the NCNS uh, WhatsApp group. Thank so you. I congratulate you on whatever you are doing and my best wishes to you. Thank you, sir. As far as uh, Moya Moya is concerned, as you rightly said, that Moya Moya disease remains an enigma. It remains difficult to understand. And it may not be wrong to state that the last word in Moya Moya disease has not yet been completely entirely said. We are still discussing direct, indirect, this bypass, that bypass. We are still discussing, but nobody can say for sure this is better or that is better or this is not should not be done. So last word has not been said. 
the most important thing dr shiv shankar you could have uh, complimented on dr spetsler work on this subject you see spetsler was the first one to show that you just put the artery on the brain don't have to do the bypass you just put the artery on the brain and do an angiogram after 3 months or 6 months you find that there is a bypass done by nature and this was a serendipitous discovery by uh, bob spetsler where this kind of indirect bypass so you understand what i say like yes. what you said you yes. just put the artery even if you don't open the arachnoid like what you said that arachnoid should be opened even if you don't open the arachnoid, just place the STA on the brain and after three months you do an angiogram, you see the bypass complete by and the entire NCA tree can be seen by through that bypass. So in KM hospital where we used to do this kind of indirect bypass, my colleague Dr. Natkani used to do at that time and he used to, you know, we used to uh, do this bypass uh, indirect and after three months he used to bring an angiogram to me, see the whole STA, MC has been formed. So consistently, the way he was showing me all the time that the whole MCA tree has been reformed just by putting the MC, uh, the STA on the brain. So this kind of magic, you see, this is a magic bypass done by nature. The other thing that you have noticed, the magic bypass of nature in Suzuki's grading or the grade six, where well, what happens is you leave the patient like that and you see hundreds, not one or two bypasses. There are hundreds of ECA arteries which come into the brain and make bypasses from all over the place. And I have got some very high profile people, even some neurosurgeons in my list of Moya Moya disease, where I've said, you just do conservative treatment. And I have got follow up on these patients where natural bypasses have been done without any kind of surgery. So whatever said and done, it is a kind of a difficult thing to understand. So what happened was recently, I was talking to Bob Spetzler and I asked him, there was a meeting going on of Moya Moya disease. And I asked him, uh, Dr. Spetzler, this is one of your greatest contribution in neurosurgery, where you said that this kind of magic bypass can be done. And now what is your take on this? What do you think today? What should be done? So he said that I think that direct bypasses have a special indication and direct bypasses should be done. This is what he said. And in the radiology lecture which Dr. Chawan gave, he showed that the blood flow in the brain affected by Moya Moya disease it is a little bit slower than the normal brain. So if you do direct bypasses, this is what this Chinese doctor, Dr. Bin Zhu, who is now very, very popular in Moya Moya, you must have heard this name, Binzu, Z-X-U, Binzu. He has done several hundred bypasses on uh, Moya Moya disease. He has got international referral system on. And he shows that in cases with Moya Moya, direct bypasses have a big role. This is what he said. Now, my take on this will be that I feel that in Moya Moya disease, the ST, the NCA branches also become very thin. They are not even seen on angiogram. So they become thin. So to do bypass is not always so easy a procedure, but it is a good procedure. I wish that all of the young people in the audience who are listening to this story of bypass <laughs> must learn STA and NCA bypass, must learn how to do STA and NCA bypass. And one of the big case volume that you can get is Moya Moya disease. I see my dear Paritosh on the screen and I wish to hear from him what he has to say. He's one of our big stars in neurosurgery. His hair, I like his hairstyle. If you can turn lateral, my dear Paritosh, just show the hairstyle, which is one of the most unique hairstyles. So he will talk to us on what he feels about Moya Moya disease and what he feels about. He does a lot of uh, interventional radiological procedures. I know he's very good in bypass surgery. So Paritosh, what is your take on Moya Moya disease? We want to hear from you. Sir, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, I think uh, most of the participants have uh, said what has to be said. Uh, what, uh, what I have learned in all these uh, years of procedure is uh, there are a few things. 
One is that um, most of the times, as Dr. Majumdar and everybody said, that uh, for diagnosis, you don't really need an angiogram. Uh, but sometimes what happens is that uh, as uh, the middle meningeal artery makes a bypass on itself, and when you operate on these patients, it is very, in those patients, it is even more important to preserve that middle meningeal artery. So if you have a knowledge of angiogram uh, that uh, this is some bypass has already been done then you will be extra careful so that is what uh, so what we do is that we plan everything for surgery and on the morning of the uh, first surgery we do uh, the angiogram and the first bypass and the same anesthesia most of the complications that we have seen is because of anesthesia and perioperative management and not because of the uh, occlusion of that M4 vessel for 15-20 minutes. So it can be hypercarbia, it can be pain management, it can be hyperventilation. All these things can cause the thing. So perioperative management of uh, Moya Moya disease patients, especially in patients who have recurrent TIAs just before the surgery, is very, very important because those patients have very poor cerebrovascular reserve. The patients who have had a stroke three months back and no symptoms after that, they are relatively fine. They will not have any major problems. Regarding di direct and indirect, in pediatrics, really everything works. And there is really, as Sir said, uh, you just put a ST and it does it as, but in adults, generally, um, the STMC bypass direct techniques have a better chance, a better uh, results. Why we attempt to do uh, an STMC bypass uh, in all the patients, including all the pediatric patients, is two. Uh, one is that we haven't seen any difference in complication rate between these two procedures. Uh, as I said, most of the complication is because of uh, the anesthesia and the perioperative management. And uh, we attempt to do all the every uh, direct procedures in all the patients. Now, in some patients, we see that the recipient, the STA will always be fine. But the recipient vessel is itself is very, very thin and very small. So in those patients, of course, we uh, do indirect procedure and get out of there. I generally don't do bilateral procedures in the same setting because the risk becomes unacceptably high. This is a preventive surgery to prevent another stroke. And you need to, uh, your complication rates needs to be as close to zero as possible. The only complication which is more and exclusive to the uh, direct procedure is, of course, hyperperfusion syndromes. And those settle down almost all the time with good perioperative management. Uh, so, and the other reason why we always do a direct STMC bypass because it's a very good procedure and it's a very good uh, learning technique to do uh, direct anastomosis in almost all patients without increasing the uh, the complication rate. So that has been our results. Uh, regarding the complications, most of the complications will happen in patients who are, who we say that which are hot patients, mm. who are having recurrent TIAs or multiple strokes. And in patients who have had posterior, posterior circulation uh, involvement. So in, post, in patients who have posterior circulation involvement, the, uh, the collaterals from the posterior circulation are not good enough uh, as compared to patients who have good, no posterior circulation involvement. So in these two patients, you have to be very, very, very careful. And uh, do that. regarding what is the role of antiplatelets and other things, it's really not uh, long-term antiplatelets and everything is really not uh, very, very uh, scientific. But of course, people have shown that bypasses done with aspirin have a better result than bypasses done without uh, aspirin. So we don't stop aspirin uh, as many other people do. A clopidogrel, of course, we stop, but aspirin, we don't stop. So this is what uh, some limited learning that I've done in the past few years or something. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Paritosh, for sharing your thoughts. And Dr. Paritosh has even operated one of our residents and he is doing very well. Uh, uh, I see Dr. Uh, Mishra, sir, has uh, joined the uh, Zoom and I request Dr. Mishra uh, to uh, shed some more light with his great experience and expertise. Hmm. 
Acho que ela tem um Mas esse é leco, tá? Yeah, Yeah, I just saw him. 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 Yeah, I just
this is uh, i think left ica completely blocked ap and uh, lateral and ap then uh, this is eca on the same side you can see beautiful uh, extracranial to intracranial revascularization then this is on the opposite side ica hardly any flow the opposite side eca again good flow i think this is right side the flow is little less so when we uh, did a vertebral angio it showed that the pca on this side is patent and it has directly communicate with with the aca and pca on the this side is uh, uh, <laughs> stenosed and there is hardly any flow going into the aca so uh, what would the expert suggest to do in such case so in my uh, reading uh, the mca uh, territory on both side is fairly well perfused uh, the ac territory on right side is hypoperfused and she is symptomatic for 4 5 months consistently ritosh what do you have to say give some ideas because i didn't hear the case properly you it will be so you sorry just... sir was i too fast or was i no, no. i got involved in some phone call unnecessarily oh, so okay. to just summarize the story and gives your thoughts yeah, so this is a patient who has uh, fairly good revascularization on both sides from bilateral indirect revascularization. And because of the involvement of the posterior circulation, she has uh, ACA territory hypoperfusion, which is symptomatic currently, as I understand. Um, what I would suggest is to uh, uh, is try medical management for some time. Uh, with uh, we use a drug called midodrine, which is an alpha agonist, and which increases the collateral blood supply. And by that time, there is more M MCA to ACA collaterals can develop. So uh, we use midodrine quite frequently, especially in children because they don't have any major problems, and of course all these other hydration and other things. But if even with that, it does not uh, go away. Then the only other option, there are two options, of course. There are one, there is one option called STA, ACA bypass. If there like are, a... Sir, if one STA is available, then you can do what is called an STA, ACA bypass, which is at the base of the uh, frontal lobe. Or you could try to do an indirect revascularization on the ACA surface. So paramedian incision and a fairly large, uh, fairly long incision and put some pericranium over it. Uh, that would probably work. Uh, but these are very, very rare cases. So there is no good, right or wrong answer to these questions. But you could try an indirect revascularization and th that probably will work with pericranium. So that should work in the in the paramedian area where the ACA territory is. So we've done a couple of cases with that and that has worked. Another thing is, you know what, Ranjit? Yes, sir. You see, one is <laughs> indirect bypass. One is direct bypass. And the third thing that we somehow not, you know, we try to neglect is conservative non-treatment option, like observation. It is not always necessary that if you see some abnormality, you have to treat it. If you see some kind of little here and there vascular abnormality, you have to treat it and you can get away with it. There are, you know, big possibilities particularly in moya moya disease, where the non-interference of any kind of treatment may just be the best option. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. And also, you know, these drugs, these blood thinners like aspirin and all those things may be indicated here and there, but their role also is not less than controversial. So I will say there too, if I have to summarize, of course, I have to hear what Kostub is saying. Because he's waiting desperately to talk to us. Bounce. One is that, you know, there is some kind of strange phenomena happening in Moya Moya disease. Some kind of revascularization is already happening if you see the angiography properly in all cases, not just grade 6, but in earlier cases also, means uh, in earlier grades also, you will find some kind of natural anastomosis going on. So there is nature plays a big role in any case. 
if you see like for grade six, as I was mentioning, you see an angiogram, there are 100 bypasses being done by the nature. So if nature is doing 100 bypasses, and if we are interfering in those bypasses in some, by doing craniotomy, we have to think about it. I'm not saying bypasses are not good. Bypasses, direct bypasses is a good option and maybe probably the best option. Indirect bypasses has a huge role in the treatment of moya moya. But non-operative, conservative observation has also a good, great indication in the treatment. I have not seen your case properly, Ranjit, but in your case, <laughs> conservative observation may be the best option. So we uh, try to uh, do all conservative measures, including what Dr. Parito said, hydration and uh, reduction of extraneous activity. And we followed up for four to six months and unfortunately the episodes continue. Fortunately, she didn't have a major stroke. Uh, so uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, the uh, logical conclusion was either to do a bypass directly on ACA, which I don't know if anybody does. And we didn't want to sacrifice the already beautifully anastomized MCA, uh, this STMCA uh, indirect bypasses. And there was no other artery available. And then we uh, did a 3D study and we found out that in the first surgery, actually the amount and number of burr holes uh, placed in the midline strip, paramedian area, were not great. So uh, even though she was 17, 18, we subjected her to, again, uh, indirect bypasses with small stab incisions and small incisions. And we did uh, uh, around 10, 12 uh, burr holes we uh, added in the midline, uh, I mean, paramedian area and the posterior parietal and uh, occipital area. And a few months since the surgery, till now, she is doing good. I, I mean, uh, we have to update you after, say, six months or a year with <laughs> another perfusion study. And that definitely we will do. They are a very uh, dedicated family and they will undergo all those uh, tests that we advocate. So uh, it's not a right time to present the case actually as a final result. But we'll definitely update about that case. I would uh, request if anybody else has any thoughts on this case. And of course, uh, questions to all the uh, presentations. Kaustub is waiting eagerly. Dr. Mishra is here, I think. I would also like to say something afterwards. Yeah, sure. Uh, is Dr. Mishra here? Can Sir, is I, I think I have to switch off my... Sir, I was there. I was there. One thing you are not yeah, discussing like, bilateral uh, my, my, my timing during so. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am listening very intently to all the, uh, both the the you know kind of the talks and the philosophy of Atul. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoying it, yeah. But I, I mean, I have an interest for a long time. Uh, but I think Kostu wants to talk something. No, let him finish and then I can tell something. Kostu want to talk something. Kostu, go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so um, um, this year we finished uh, 50th of our patient done bilaterally, Moya for Moya Moya. And uh, this is just a small experience and some uh, uh, things that I wanted to share. My interest was kindled by Dr. Nadkarni and then I spent a few days with Dr. Suzuki in Japan. But um, I think uh, I want to give a few disclaimers. I have been doing in the 50 odd patients, 50 plus odd patients that I've done, I have done attempted only five direct bypasses who were all adults more than 25 mm -hmm. years of age. One of them failed. Three of them worked all right. All other patients, I have done indirect uh, revascularization using STA bypass. So I just want to uh, highlight one factor to people who are just going to start doing this surgery is that this is one surgery which I start the incision under microscope. The skin incision under microscope to protect the STAs as much as possible, get as much perivascular cuff as possible. Only one patient we did with a, a myocutaneous flap, sorry, uh, the muscle flap, and uh, there was some issue with the healing in that patient, and there was in increased incidence of seizures also. That is one thing that I want to comment. I would like to hear other people's uh, opinion about it. And uh, the incidence of perioperative stroke was in two patients, so I would say about uh, 2 or 4%, 2% in my uh, cases. We presented this uh, data of 32 patients in the last NSI, and uh, this is just what I wanted to share. Thank you. 
Yeah, 50 is the impressive number. As 40 is the impressive number function. Marjake. We are still below 50 20. Bilateral. 50 bilaterals. Bilateral. So, so we almost you know. always yeah. do bilateral. And we have around 90 No, patients. no. I have done only bilateral together only once for financial reasons. Otherwise, okay. uh, <laughs> we space the procedures about... Uh, we used to initially place them six months apart. And uh, I just wanted to tell Dr. Goel that all the patients had suffered either uh, one or two strokes. So no patient was asymptomatic or just caught uh, in the array of investigations and then operated. So some of them already had developed strokes, or but um, the recovery, cognitive deficits, intellectual capacities, motor deficits, all have shown good recovery. So uh, in, for indirect also you stage uh, sites because with bicoronal it's easier to do on either no side. I don't do together I don't do together so all almost all we have done is with bicoronal and direct we have around nineteen and one two patients had perioperative strokes we don't have anybody who has done direct <laughs> call somebody or send for for yeah that's all. Uh, may, may I ask a question, Anil Karapur Kariya? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hey, sure. 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 I, I have attended the entire uh, <laughs> webinar. Uh, the question I have is, what is your indication for surgery? Atul uh, Goel uh, started Go saying, or no. covered it partially, I would say. But uh, what is the, when do you do offer surgery? So all of you our do, patients uh, have you, reached one, after one sec, one sec. Is it only clinical, or do you establish? Uh, I mean, do some investigation to show hyperperfusion, and if you do investigations to show hyperperf hypoperfusion, which is the best one? Is it spec study? Is it MR? Is it uh, isotope challenge scan? I mean, uh, acetazolamide. Challenge scan. What 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 is your indication for surgery? This is my question. So I'll uh, for all of uh, you. Uh, you short, for all yeah, of I'll you. give my short answer. So then I think in uh, and Shankar also. So uh, right. we previously yeah. used to do PET scan for uh, metabolism and topian. Moyama is essentially a radiological diagnosis, and all patients that we had, they have reached us after multiple strokes or multiple TI. So uh, we don't have a single case where it was incidentally radiologically diagnosed and then uh, we have done anything for that. So all patients were symptomatic. They had repeated strokes, repeated TIs. Now we don't do uh, uh, PET or SPECT. We do uh, uh, CT uh, perfusion studies, which are now excellent. And with our new machine, we can increase the volume of almost 8 centimeter vertically and gives excellent studies. I did show a few images from that. Uh, yeah, initially we used to do uh, DSA for everybody, but last uh, five to seven years, MR perfusion has been the mainstay. We do CT perfusion nowadays post-op, but to just rule out whether no new strokes are developing. But uh, MR perfusion pre-operatively and post-operatively at uh, three months interval have been the mainstay of our protocol. In addition, I think cognitive delay and developmental delay also decline. Cognitive, progressive cognitive yeah. decline. Yes. And developmental delay assumes more importance in, in, a, in a documented case of Moyama. So that also can be uh, in pediatric patients, especially we use that indication uh, for hastening the or preventing further cognitive decline. Yeah, I forgot to mention. And almost all patients have improvement in scholastic scores post revascularization. Can I make some comments? Yes, sir. We are oh, awaiting eagerly yeah. for your comments. Yeah. So, number one, uh, I started off with indirect. 1988 was the first case we did. And we changed <laughs> over to direct all the cases. And now we do for all adults, we do direct. These are all symptomatic patients. We don't do asymptomatic patients. And the, the choice of investigation in our cases is uh, last many years, uh, no angio, no DSA anymore. It's only MR and your MR perfusion. And uh, we today, uh, currently we do adults, we try to do um, the direct, <laughs> but all direct patients have an indirect associated with. So it's a combined procedure for every single patient, wherever we are doing direct also. 
for children uh, we used to do more direct but now if the patient has symptomatic hemisphere the one which is symptomatic hemisphere we try to do direct but if the 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 you know quiet or the the one which is relatively asymptomatic hemisphere which we do after 3 months uh, if the patient has had no no uh, stroke in that territory or has no evidence of any infarction the perfusion is good we would do an elective indirect uh, bypass indirect is mostly edams and if you are doing indirect any time we always uh, always combine with baroles multiple baroles uh, so increase the area of perfusion now there are uh, enough literature available and unfortunately there is actually no class one evidence to suggest the 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 usefulness of surprisingly usefulness of bypass in moyama disease presenting with ischemia there is class one evidence and it's a double blind trial from japan where the moyama the the bypass is better in patients who have had presented with hemorrhage and they're surprising there is no study till date where is a is a class one evidence to suggest that it is better but there are many studies which is class 3 uh, and is the largest probably from china where it suggests that uh, it does uh, the the morbidity and mortality compared to conservative management medical management is statistically significantly better when you have done a bypass in children uh, the data whether you direct or indirect uh, is very little data to support either one the one uh, indirect is as good as direct uh, if there are multiple studies which has come out and the groups which do all the di- indirect the groups who try to do direct uh, but generally there is very little difference between direct and indirect in children there is some definite difference between direct and indirect in adults because obviously the 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 collateral development is much lower and in the latency period you can have uh, strokes <clears throat> so if somebody is capable of doing direct uh, it's better to do direct according to me in a uh, in a adult patient and a, anybody above say, maybe 7 8 years old it is easier to do it younger children unless and you are very competent it's sometimes difficult to uh, to achieve that now all the patients are followed up and we also try to do in uh, in uh, two stages uh, we usually do first stage and then after 3 months we call them back and that time uh, we do the second bypass and then we follow up with after 3 months 6 months after the first surgery uh, we do the perfusion studies because of logistic the cost factor and so on uh, and the other thing about ecosprin uh, the largest uh, which uh, atul talked about <laughs> binshu uh, i had some personal discussion with him he is very strongly against use of ecosprin after immediate uh, post op period and if i talk to dr udani brajes udani who is a brilliant pediatric surgeon to my mind is very good and very theoretically very very strong he said there is no basis of using uh, ecosprin though we all use it and uh, unfortunately when you stop it you know many neurologists would call back and say how can you stop it and unfortunately if the patient has a ti or a stroke when you have stopped it is a major major problem and that has happened to me i stopped ecosprin and the patient went back and promptly had a ti and the patients were very very upset and then why did you stop and so on but i talked to bin su who has not hundreds he has thousands of uh, stmc i mean he he does i think i think now he's reaching 5000 or something now maybe so he's on beyond 10000 <laughs> yeah some day maybe maybe last time i talked it was 5000 but <laughs> it does it, it doesn't every day so according to him there is no basis and obviously they have a very large experience in fact he said that if you use ecosprin there is higher risk if you are doing a high direct bypass there is a high risk of hemorrhage so you should not be using it so the bottom line is is the is the eg surgery i mean start off with the edams uh, if you are doing it and if you are doing uh, i think there is some data to suggest that if you are doing a combined uh, procedure is better because what happens is direct case takes care of the blood flow or the blood circulation immediately whereas the indirect is a long term uh, protection by indirect is better there is study available from chicago the fadi sarbers group is a very nice study uh, i don't know whether if you have read that uh, they have they have very nicely demonstrated how the temporal course of these different bypasses so over a long period of time the indirect bypass has a better protection than the direct bypass the direct bypass protection is very good <laughs> now there is a study from taiwan dr yong kwang tu is a brilliant vascular surgeon he is a very very i have seen him operating and he is a brilliant vascular surgeon and he always advocated uh, uh, direct bypasses and the last meeting we 
we were together, he presented their data from Taiwan. And uh, in fact, the, the the complications were higher in the direct. His, his, I mean, his data he presented, the two different surgeons were operating and he was doing direct and the other guy was doing indirect. And he was very, very, I mean, it was very nice of him to come out that his complications were higher than the indirect bypass group. And that was, uh, that was really, I was so impressed with the data because very few people will come out with this kind of data, uh, which is a fine, he's a very fine vascular surgeon. He's a massive experience. Uh, but so that is a, there is some increased risk of direct bypass um, if you're doing uh, in, especially in children. Uh, so bottom line, children, I don't think it matters whether you do what, but I think operation is, uh, operation is Im important and is necessary for patients who are symptomatic. Adult direct bypass is probably better. If I do direct, I always do an indirect along with them. So and we, also, we, we always patients. put muscle. We always, every single patient, uh, <laughs> whether we are doing EDAMS, it is always M associated with whether direct, indirect, everything we do, muscle we put it. And we haven't had a problem okay. with, uh, with uh, oh, epilepsy. Oh, that that oh, oh, there, people who don't do it. Uh, in oh, fact, Jack Foray oh, is very, oh, very, oh, very oh, concerned, oh, concerned oh, about oh, the risk oh, of epilepsy. Oh, but the the Germany group, uh, you know, the guy which is uh, what's his name? Uh, the the very uh, he's a very good vascular surgeon. Peter Weiser. Peter uh, Weiser. What's his? Peter Weiser. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, he 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 has again very nice studies. He's interested in this, uh, and if people are interested, who can go to his? They have a group now. They're doing a lot of research on this, and they do always put the muscle. Muscle on the dura. <laughs> The dura is always inverted. Dura is not a problem. Yeah. It's always it's always not like you uh, said of a muscle producing uh, fix. It is, it so, muscle strip you put, so muscle strip? Muscle, I know. You split the muscle. We split the muscle and then part of this with a pedicle and it goes uh, under the under the dura. It's it's the part which is not covered uh, by the, you know, you put a STMC graft and the empties, the dura, uh, the dura, the stillet cuts are made. The dural flaps that goes inside like uh, I think Sitsankar showed that. Uh, dural flash goes inside, so it covers more areas. And the the open areas are covered by muscle. Exposed areas are covered by muscle. Okay. okay. Actually, for twigs of but there are many ways inside of... the brain. So there is... Thank you very much, sir. So I have a question for everybody. Does anybody have experience with uh, uh, ACA? Direct ACA revascularization. I, I have not done. I have not done it. Direct? <laughs> direct what? Direct revascularization for ACA. <laughs> no, I haven't done. I've done a couple of indirect revascularization, as I said, on that stuff. So we done. always feel that uh, direct bypass takes care of the MCA tree, but uh, uh, ACA tree uh, is. We don't do, but uh, patients who have been done outside what we have followed, uh, uh, angiograms. Uh, Dr. Rajendra also showed me a few couple of his uh, experiences that ACA tree is uh, very frequently poorly perfused. Uh, that this case we showed it was indirect, but we did not put enough holes <coughs> in the ACA territory. So. Um, Thank you, everybody. Uh, anybody has uh, uh, questions for expert panels? Uh, please welcome. Yeah, I have one question. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, what will be your strategy, or uh, anybody can answer this? Uh, in acute stroke, the patients, I mean, the kids who come with acute stroke, uh, how do you plan the surgeries? Like, well, because it is an uh, ischemic brain, it needs a blood immediately, or we wait for some time, and how much time uh, you all wait? Because so we haven't had, fortunately, a patient coming with a very large acute stroke. Repeated TI is yes. We wait for a couple of days, and if we find the patient is hemodynamically stable, doesn't have a fluctuating deficit, uh, then uh, we go ahead with indirect vascularization. Well, we have seen multiple patients with uh, acute. In fact, in fact, it is not uncommon in my practice. Uh, we have never done an acute surgery. It's always elective surgery, and the patient is managed by the you know the either the neurologist or pediatric neurologist, and then uh, we do elective. I, I have now never done a, a urgent uh, surgery for right. an acute stroke. I usually wait for three weeks. Sometimes investigate them because our two patients had thalassemia. Okay. 
well by the way in the kausto uh, this is mandatory yeah. that the neurologist has to tell there is no yeah. cause found otherwise it's not mlm anyway so uh, in fact Correct. i because i mean i my interest i get a lot of patients who who have not been evaluated so i never i never trust them it goes back to the neurologist no, I, and yeah, or yeah. pediatric neurologist they have to Correct. tell pediatric you know sometimes this arthritis can present like that and now the definition has changed is initial the japanese definition was bilateral symmetric it's no more it's unilateral is also yes. myoma now this is this yes. is now yes. changed yes. definition so the, the so now same, the same comes with thing that and there this reversible thing is there now that is another thing which is they don't need any treatment at all and then arthritis you're not supposed to treat i mean they are they are inflammatory thing yes. so they go on to and this our radiologist what they say that you can decide, you can find it out of course you can do a pet spec all those things but simply uh, mr uh, they have i can't tell you what sequence but they can find out whether there is uh, there is uh, inflammation in the arterial wall and whether the active arthritis is there or not there there or not there so if they say yes. whether even if all the markers are negative if it the arterial wall is inflamed we we don't do anything we wait it's a vessel vessel wall imaging vessel wall yeah, imaging vessel. Yeah, vessel wall imaging, correct. Yeah, that was the case initially showed. Uh, one of our new. Yeah, no, I, I was in. I was in another. Yeah, meeting. yeah, yeah. I, I didn't. Another question I had. No, what's again? Another thing that's, you know, a little bit of my interest. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I was actually surprised when uh, Kostub said that he has done fifty cases with bilateral moyamoy. So I am wondering, Kostub, how many moyamoy patients so is it? Twenty-five into two or fifty yes, into two. Yes, yes. Fifteen into two. No, no. Just listen. Just listen to what my question is. One is you have done bilateral in fifty. Have you done only unilateral, or you have all cases you have done bilateral? Or if you have done unilateral, how many you have done? So how many collection? How many cases you have done of myeloma? So there are fifty patients done bilateral. Fifty patients done bilateral, and uh, some are waiting now. Last say six months, some of them are waiting to undergo for the opposite side, but uh, are bilateral, but not the same stage, uh, staged bilateral. Initially, we used to do six months. Now I do three months or four months also. But if the patient is asymptomatic, we can wait. i'm also quite uh, keen to know shiv shankar was talking about quite a large number shiv shankar how, ma how many numbers of moa moa you have treated in your career so this 40 procedures we have done uh, in uh, around uh, 20 25 patients so most of the patients they have undergone bilateral so initially uh, i used to do bilateral in a single setting but we never had any uh, perioperative or uh, post operative impacts but later on uh, we when we started doing uh, bypass direct bypass so we started doing on only one side initially i used to do edams on both the sides in a single setting so basan i want to ask you a question are you not surprised that in smaller cities like kolhapur and uh, you know little bit small city like pune there is no, pune is not a small city pune is the <laughs> Cultural capital of Maharashtra, you can't call them as it. <laughs> no, are you not surprised that uh, you know? No, but I'm aware of. I mean, I, I, I mean, because to I think I, we met in the NSI meeting, so I, we, we were. He was telling me that he's you know, one of his uh, residents was presenting. So I'm aware. That, I mean, Sip Shankar has been putting in this MC NSI. Yes, it is. It is. Uh, I mean, the, not small cities, but uh, the the data is so massive now. I mean, the point is, myeloma disease, which was thought to be rare in India, is not so rare really. I mean, it is it's probably not diagnosed as much because the the neurologist has to send to the neurosurgeon to be evaluated, and they most of them get an arthritis or a stroke, and that's about it. So that is the problem. I think it's much more common than what we thought about thirty years back, probably. I will give you statistics of my tenure of twenty four years as head of department in KM, and uh, as I mentioned to you. that many of our cases were done by indirect bypass by dr narkani during a prolonged period of time when he was with me working with me and my feeling is that he have not done more than 100 cases i don't know the exact numbers in i am talking of more than 25 30 years of time 
where he was working with me during the entire phase, I don't think he has done more than 100 or 120 cases. So if that tenure I'm talking about, and the KEM, as you know, is a big drainer of all kinds of diseases in the brain. And if I've seen 120 during 30 year period, I'm surprised to see that, uh, you know, uh, Atul, I think what has happened in the last 10 years, the numbers have increased significantly. Yeah, I mean, you were talking definitely. probably 20 years, I mean, 15 or 10 years back, I mean, when when Nadkarni was working in probably, I don't know how long back. Eh? But I think the last few years, no, because of the imaging and because of the awareness, is significantly increased. I mean, I used to get many patients from, you know, there are this, especially Brajesh Udani, who is there with me, is very active. So, he's, he has got an interest. So, and he has a lot of fellows. So those fellows, I mean, they discuss, but these patients are operated locally now. But no more, I mean, they, we, I, I don't uh, operate anymore those patients because it's much cheaper, much much more, much less expensive for them to get operated wherever they are. And if you're doing it indirect, I mean, it's an easy procedure. So, you know. Can I divulge my secret? Go ahead. I was working in two hospitals which had very strong pediatric departments. Yeah, that is a very fortunate and thing for you. And both the interventional radiologists are my friends. So they do all the DSS. Ah. <laughs> and that's how I collected most of these cases. So you, know, you have to have your, your neurologist or pediatric neurologist. Has to, maybe yes, neurologists, pediatric are, neurologist. neurologists have come last 10 years, maybe pediatric neurologists in Pune. But the interventional radiologists were getting all the cases for DSA initially. And they were the people who referred to me. So my last question is, you know, when I talked to, as Basant was saying about Bin Zhu, he talked about experience with 10,000 cases. And one man experience with 10,000 cases. So you think, uh, Basant, we are in India, we have diagnosed 10,000 moya moya in the entire country? No, 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 no. no. They're definitely more common in China and the the... Pacific, not Pacific, the China and uh, Japan, definitely more common. There's no yes. question about it. East Asian business. Hmm. There is so, definitely no no question because they have the predilection. I mean, there are a lot of the lot of studies. I mean, research. I am not up to date just now. I can't tell you, but they they do a lot of studies, and uh, so they're much more much more. What do you say, Paritos? Isn't it? I mean, is they much, much more. Much more common, sir. Much more common. I mean, you can't have 10,000 cases. I mean, one surgeon is... Of course, he gets patients from... I think he travels also gets up everywhere. I think he, it's not that everybody is operating 10,000 cases. He is unique. I mean, that that sense. I don't think many Chinese neurosurgeons are operating that many cases. But but they are numbers that still a lot of... I mean, I went to Hong Kong uh, for a meeting. Uh, not in the Hong Kong, but there is, there is another uh, city, which is the twin city of Hong Kong that belongs to China, says something like that, saying or whatever name, I can't remember, some many years back. And they had a huge number. That guy was a vascular neurosurgeon in China who was doing left, right and center. So, I mean, he's not very active uh, in the meetings, uh, but very large numbers. In Japan and everything, there is a screening as well. So they do a huge number of asymptomatic uh, yeah. as well. So the the genetic, genetic data here, where after so many cases have been diagnosed, Kausto, where you have diagnosed, do we do you go into the genetic analysis? And is one moya moya same as other, or is they are, they are different? Maybe chromosomal abnormalities, Down syndrome, SLE, all those that. So maybe that also may be making an impact on the on the on the progress and the outcome. I mean, no, the neurologists the, the, have screened the, the, them. These SLE and Down syndrome, they are different group. Yes. They are, they are Moyama syndrome. They are not Moyama disease. Yeah. Only chromosomal abnormality, pure chromosome. They have found some chromosome. I, I don't ask mm -hmm. me. I can't remember now. But they are found uh, for Moyama without all those syndromes. Only Moyama, Moyama disease mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. have found. But not Down syndrome is not. They are called Moyama syndrome. They are not Moyama disease. No. But are there are there patients who have undergone surgery for those? I, mean, I don't recollect uh, post radiation moya moya whether we have operated. No, I I have operated SLE. I don't have a Down syndrome which I have operated. I can't remember. I have, but I have operated SLE. I mean, post radiation. I can only tell. Yeah, yeah. I can only tell that there is no family history. Okay. I I have patients with family history also. In fact, the one of the last patients I operated uh, with two sisters, and the second sister had a problem. Um, had a problem in the the hemisphere which was not i mean the i operated one hemisphere the other side hemisphere he had a major stroke so 
<laughs> the first patient was very good and this the patient second sister came i operated and in the peri operative period uh, maybe 2 3 down the down the time she had a major major stroke on the the contralateral side which was not operated so there is this a recent case maybe last uh, within last 6 7 months yeah, there is familial moya moya we have yeah. patients who have identical twins brother sister yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. I have, I have, I can't tell you the number, but I have, I have, I have few cases where there is familial. I think regarding the increased numbers in India, I think there is more awareness amongst the neurologists yeah. that the neurosurgeons are now treating Moya Moya disease, and that's why there is increased effort. So, I, just like aneurysms was there forty years back. We Plus, are... investigation, na. Yeah. For those now with the MRI, every everybody MRI, can get an MRI, which was Absolutely. previously or not available for them. Yeah. I mean, twenty years back, a patient my MRI was difficult to get, expensive, patient would not reach, and so so many things. And the pediatric neurologist group has increased. increased. You see, the number of pediatric neurologists in the country has significantly increased. Yeah. That is also another uh, thing which I said. Yeah, yeah, I also... have one thing to say, sir. Uh, since i think uh, you all are working in metro cities i am in kolapur which is strategically placed around 500 km from mumbai and bangalore so i have my cousin and co brother who is a pediatrician trained from aims my from mahesh kamte is a well well known pediatrologist so uh, most of the cases what i get are trickle patients from nimans and bangalore and mumbai they come to us and he is the guy who refers many epilepsy surgeries many hemiprotomies we do in our center so uh, initially i was surprised when i was in uh, kolapur that uh, so many patients come for uh, surgeries because when the patients reach the metro cities very few patients reach metro cities mainly the uh, poor patients so they don't find uh, any treatment and they neither reach the metro cities or nor uh, they afford the treatment in the metro cities so most of the patients we get here because being a charitable hospital so we generate a good number and even with counseling most of the patients are almost around 10% they could not turn up for a surgery also yeah yeah no it's very very expensive i mean it's uh, in fact my hospital is extremely expensive compared to i mean what kolapur you can do it even kolapur why kolapur even in many other cities uh, it's very very expensive so very few people i mean i i, I in fact i encourage them suppose somebody says that uh, pediatric neurologist that we have somebody who is doing i said please go ahead and uh, mostly from gujarat by because i have a large dentist from gujarat and there are a lot of people who have been trained with dr udani uh, they they fellows who have gone back and we just discuss over the phone and because the expense is prohibitive there is no question about it yes because for us uh, most of the patients are from karnataka because he is in belgaum we never got patients from surrounding region in kolapur uh, and we need to do them in a surgical package around 50000 rupees that includes state to discharge including medicine i think it's good that it is metros are expensive so other people can do it <laughs> young people in small places can do better yeah. does anybody do uh, has anybody done omental transposition but you know the history of omental transplant no you have talk i don't know whether because i didn't i didn't hear the whole talk of it omental transplant history you people know some young people may not know no no sir think i you know who, did, who, who, who pioneered it No, you don't know. No, I read in Rangacharya. No, no, Jacob no. Abraham, oh. neurosurgeon from Bellore. His oh, main fine. research project was a mental transplant for all ischemia, and he had a, now he presented, he published, and but never took off because it's a very very major surgery for yes, ischemia. Sir, so yes. never never took off. But uh, Dr. Jacob Abraham original work was I mean nineteen seventies. so he is one of the pioneers of i mean he had a lot of interest in stroke of course yeah but uh, after i told me many times i probably yeah, yeah. I just trying to feel for it yeah you know what uh, was another very big contribution of jacob abraham was regarding shunts i don't know exactly what complete what uh, contribution was but he had one huge co- uh, contribution about shunts in posterior fossa tumor or something like that so this dr jacob abraham looks quite a you know no no he is a he is a very thinking surgeon he like you also a little bit like you <laughs> he is but I, i don't know whether you guys uh, would be anybody has seen dr jacob abraham because dr jacob abraham used to come as examiner when i was uh, my doing my mch in uh, in aims i mean this is i am digressing so before you close i tell you the story 
Dr. Jacob Abraham will keep a nice smile all his time and the exam will finish and then he te he'll tell you that you told everything wrong. That's it. I mean, you will not have a clue that you are you are going to fail. I mean, he was the most difficult examiner. I, I mean, he was not my examiner. He was my examiner so very good. But he he was examining. He used to be there uh, arranging cases for the examination. So he would be never never would show anything that that fellow is saying good or bad or whatever. At the end, he will say all that you said was wrong, <laughs> and he'll give that. <laughs> He was, he was some some kind of professor. He had visited Pune, Pune Institute of Neurology in 1996, mm -hmm. I think, after they had invited him that time. No, no, the group was, I mean, they had a brilliant uh, kind of Jacob Abraham Mathai. Jacob Abraham, the research guy, Dr. Mathai was the surgeon, actually. This was how they distributed between themselves. He, this, he was a thinking neurosurgeon. Dr. Mathai was really a good, good technical neurosurgeon. I mean, I have, I have been there seen both of them operating. Uh, Mathai was a really brilliant neurosurgeon. So, Ranjit, let us wrap it up now. Yes, thanks everybody for a very interesting uh, discussion and uh, all the expert comments. Seniors, we thank uh, very much. I think the uh, attendance you. was not up to expectation, but we will push it on YouTube and uh, all juniors will have especially the discussion was very interesting and all presentations were excellent. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank Thanks. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, sir. Sara, I can see you. Shankar managed to change yes, sir. during this period. <laughs> I think we need to hold the recording. Okay, it was a very good discussion. You know, Sarang, let us make this. Uh, I wish that uh, you know because we uh, let us organize more number of webinars than what we have. You know, what if we have six or eight or ten, we should make them, you know, multiple more. And we have eleven except February. Eleven we have. So maybe we can increase. See, let us see if we can make them, you know, more international part. Yes, sir, we will work on what more position? international participation, more people from other countries. Like, I, if you know, I would have asked Binzu to attend this uh, 